Inter Miami is closing in on the start of its 2022 MLS season, but the injuries keep piling up. Hello everybody and welcome back to Miami Total Football Radio, aka Miami Total Football Radio, the number one and most listened to podcast on Inter Miami and a podcast that has been listened to in more than 50 countries. If you're new here, well, we provide you all the latest news, updates, inside information, analysis, opinions, and much, much more. We'll be doing plenty of that today, a lot of discussion Probably some debate with regards to the state of the team as it closes in on its February 26th season opener against the Chicago Fire. Normally, we have two other co-hosts. There's only one joining me today. His name is Jose Armando, a.k.a. Cinco. Jose, how are you doing today, my friend? Hey, Franco. I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I mean, we're getting closer to the start of the regular season. I think we have... Some things that are positive within the team and some others that, you know, obviously are concerns. But for now, I guess we can concentrate on the possibility of Inter-Miami getting their first title. Is it their first title if they're able to win on Saturday? I think it is, right? If you count I mean, a preseason trophy as a title, then then yes. Well, trophy. Let's call it a trophy. The first trophy. Is it? I think it is. Yes, it would be their first trophy. They, they haven't won anything at all. So, I mean... It's 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 a positive one 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 game away from a trophy. <laughs> well, we're I'm going being optimistic already. Well, we're going to talk about the 2022 Carolina Challenge Cup. There's been two games played in that tournament since we last recorded. We'll analyze both of those games, but this will be a different pod than I initially imagined it would be, and initially planned for it to be because we do have a special guest on today's show, and I won't make it a surprise. It is. Center back Damian Lowe, who joins us for a fun and insightful interview on a lot of things regarding Inter Miami, his career, his personal life, a lot of interesting things there. It's a very good interview. Stay tuned for it. It'll come in the second segment. But obviously, there's big, big news with regards to the status of one Inter Miami player. That's Ian Frey. We will touch on his injury as well as the state of the team in general because. The team has been bitten by the injury bug in a big, big way this preseason. So let's get to it. All right, Jose. So as I mentioned before, I thought we were going to start this show by just analyzing the last two preseason matches, the the first two games of the Carolina Challenge Cup for Inter Miami. But we have to start with unfortunate news because Ian Frey, as sources told me, Earlier today, and I reported it for Miami Total Football Substack and Inter-Miami shortly thereafter, or almost simultaneously, confirmed the news. Ian Frey will be out for the season with a torn right ACL suffered in practice Tuesday. From the information that I've gathered, the team is devastated, is gutted. Because of this development, it's to the same knee that he tore his ACL in last year before preseason began during voluntary workouts and what was and that was his first season or was going to be his first season as an MLS player obviously a big blow I'm really really sad and devastated for him a young player I actually spoke to him in the second week of preseason about his recovery we spoke for a few minutes about that about what he was looking to show I thought and I, I know you're in agreement that he was probably the best player so far for Inter Miami this preseason, just in terms of the consistent performances he was putting forth, how good he looked defensively. He contributed some goals. He was penetrating the opposing half with with dribbling runs. He looked very, very good coming off that injury and having recovered. And now, obviously, another major injury that sidelines him again. Very unfortunate. Just what are your thoughts upon, or what were your thoughts upon hearing this news? Well. You know, I, I think we all in South Florida share the sentiment of just being um, hugely disappointed that this is happening to a young player like Ian Frey, only 19 years old. Um, and uh, and we, we've been to preseason games, and um, I think we can all agree that he was doing an outstanding job. And um, the coaching staff talked about him. Um, we talked about it constantly about you know, how he was making a case not only to be in the roster coming opening kick, but being a starter, actually fighting for a spot 
Like we were wondering if what he was doing in preseason was enough to take somebody out like Quinteros, because he was away with the national team for a while um, and came back with a little bit of an injury as well. If this situation didn't happen this week, we will probably be thinking like, listen, he has a shot at, at starting for this team. And so uh, it's it's hugely disappointing. Um, he's very young, but, you know, right now, just a few, a few hours after this happened, um, I, I can only imagine what he's going through, what he's thinking. And... Um, uh, I'm sure he's going to be well, well taken care of and he's going to come back. But, you know, just missing this opportunity, you never know what's going to happen in a year or so. And um, it, it's it, it, it's incredible because, you know, in terms of people that were not there for preseason games, how can we explain what he was doing so well? I think that that's something that we have to talk about so that people can really understand what we were what we're trying to say. You right. know, he was very good with the ball. Very well organized, moving forward as well, you know, without compromising the team defensively. He was able to get to the other side of the field, be effective, not giving the ball away, not a lot of mistakes from him. So, you know, those are the things that, at least for me, were working in favor of thinking this guy is for real. Absolutely. And and for me, and you know, I, I like Adi Lassiter a lot, but, and he's proven my point, but... I do believe that so far at this point, um, Ian Frey was the MVP for Inter Miami in preseason. Uh, that's I'm, I'm 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 sure about that. He was he was really good. He was that good. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I I fully agree with you on that, and and I'm really devastated for 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 him. When I heard the news from a source earlier today on Wednesday, I was hoping the information was wrong because when I spoke to him. At the start of preseason, uh, you know, I, I was first time interviewing him, and he came off as a as a really nice kid, uh, shy kid, but a nice kid that was was looking to bounce back after a tough year last year, and obviously he was off to a really good start from what we could see. Um, and you made the good point that not everyone has seen it, so maybe not everyone will understand how significant a blow this is to not only to him but to to the team because he was lining up or he was looking like he was going to be a starter. For this team on day one and and throughout the season, that's how good he he had gotten off to in this preseason. But uh, a, a big blow for him, and he'll have to work his way back once again. We wish him the best, a speedy recovery, of course. And now that opens up a spot for somebody else to to fill into that back three or that back five. Is is you know how how I describe it. Uh, I think it'll be if they if they stick with it. I think Jairo Quinteros is probably. The guy, he's a Bolivian international, has played at the higher, at the highest levels uh, in World Cup qualifying, or at least in South America. So I think it's going to be Quinteros alongside uh, or next to Damian Lowe. And then obviously as the left center back, I think it'll be continue to be Christopher McVay. Do you share the thought? Because what are the other options that they have for center back at, at this point? They could go Aime Mavica. They could go Kieran Gibbs, who played left center back as a substitute uh, in this past weekend's first game at the Carolina Challenge Cup. They could go with unsigned draft pick. They would have to sign him, of course. Ryan Saylor. I mean, there are other options, but I do think Jairo Quinteros is is the next man up uh, with Frey out. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think we can agree on that one. You know, the reality is that Kieran Gibbs, I think... You need him more like a left wing, someplace around the. Uh, well, it could he could become a left back, left wing back, you know. Well, but no, so one, I, I've heard just quickly to, to to not to interrupt you, but to to just provide a little more context. He obviously has played left wing back for Inter Miami since joining. He did so last season, but I had heard as of late he had been training as a left center back, and then on Saturday when he came into the game, his first appearance of preseason. He also was deployed at left center back, and Ian Frey actually went into the midfield during that last during those last fifteen minutes or so of the game against the Columbus Crew. But um, I agree that his natural position is a left left wing back. But I, you know, I just wanted to make the right. point that he has been looked at as a left center back uh, in training, and obviously in in this in this one of these most recent preseason games. Yeah, listen. Initially, I would have thought because I do believe that Ian Frey was doing a better job than McVeigh. I'm going to be honest with you in that one, and. Um, um, I, I would have thought Frey had a shot at, at, the, at the starting spot. But now, obviously, Quinteros comes in, and, and you have to keep McVeigh. 
I don't think Mavika will take um, because I do believe that Mavika is the replacement or the substitute for um, Damian Lowe. I think he's a lot better in the middle as a center back than as a left or right center back. So mm-hmm. um, I, I, I see him now that Ian Frey is not there. You know, um, I, I think they have to be uh, very concerned when it comes to the coaching staff because um, I don't know if Mavik, Mavika would be as good if he's not placed right in the middle of the center backs because of his mobility issues. And, um, you know, usually when you get closer to the wing, you, you have faster players attacking you. And that was something that he struggled with last year. So, um, I don't know. It's concerning, but I, I think at some point, you know, we're all just so disappointed because of this happening that we are so pessimistic about the future defensively of the team. I mean, they have a solid core right now, but, the way things are going right now with so many injuries, you can't help but think, okay, what happened if Quinteros is next and he's out for two, three weeks? So wh- what are you left with? Well, so, well, I wanted to ask you, before we get into that, because I, we absolutely 100% need to talk about the growing trend of injuries, something we touched on last week briefly. But before we do that, do you think with Frey out that they stick with the five man backline, or do you think that there's a chance that they that they change things up and go to four? I think they're going to stay with five. I think they have yeah. the center back coverage on the on the roster, the the depth to to continue to play that five that five uh, man backline. I think another injury could really test that, but I think right now they continue to stay with that five man backline they've been working on for much of preseason. Is that do you also agree with that? I think we've yeah. been agreeing so far uh, along every point so far. Yeah, I would agree with that because, you know, uh, going back to what Damian Lowe said a few um, a few weeks ago in terms of formations, 4-3-3, 3-5-2, 5-3-2, we have yet – I mean, the 4-3-3 formation is basically something that they, that they have worked – they have been working on during training, but we haven't seen much of that. Right. So um, it, it would be really hard for me to think right now that all of a sudden – on February 26th, they will start a game with a 4-3-3 formation. Right. Because it, it wouldn't make sense with what we have been able to see during preseason. Unless now, unless Frey was that important to the overall structure and they say, you know what, without Frey we can't do this. But right. I, again, I do it think, be, that, I think, I think they're going to stick with the five. I think you If know, that's the case, though, we're going to see the 4-3-3 formation on, Saturday, uh, on right. the next game. Right, this Saturday. Saturday, yeah. Yeah, against Charlotte FC. Um, you, you did touch... On a good point, but I, I think we both think that they're going to stick with the five. But you did touch on a good point that we have to talk about, and that's the injuries. Because last week I asked you and Steve and Primo Brenner, who is not on this week's pod. Uh, well, he will be later on in the interview, but he's not on right now. About the number of injuries Inter Miami was having. And I asked you if it was a concern. Because to me, it was a concern. To me, it was a bit of an alarming trend that was starting to to form or to shape or starting to take place and you said at the time that you know if we we revisited it in a week and the numbers have continued to grow or we're in the same place or that you know the team's in the same place that it was in uh a week ago then it would be more of a talking point and steve steve didn't really give me an answer he's a little bit more diplomatic he just said obviously injuries aren't aren't a great thing and you never want injuries but he never really said it whether it was a concern jose it's been a week now and not only did frey get injured as i reported on tuesday on miami total football substack kieran gibbs has suffered a hamstring injury and he suffered that in the saturday game against the columbus crew He's out for a bit of time. Not sure how long. I wasn't able to get that information. But he is out for a little bit. Now the injuries continue to pile up. Some players have recovered. We did see Leonardo Campana and Emerson Rodriguez. They, they both played on Tuesday night against the Charleston Battery. But the injuries still are piling up. And if you... I did the numbers today and, and I put it out in a tweet. At some point this preseason... There either were or there have been, in total, 12 players that were recovering from injury on Inter-Miami. 12 players out of 28. 
Two of them were, or are, Jovan Jones and Nick Marsman, who were injured last year. So let's take them out of the conversation for this topic. 10 players out of 26 have suffered an injury or have had to recover from an injury at some point in this, these five weeks of preseason. How concerned are you by that? Ah, it's a good question. It's a really, really good question. Um, as we get closer to the to the start of the season, and um, you obviously want to have a full squad to start, even though we all know it's it's a long run, it's a long season. You want to have your full squad, and um, because you want to get off to a good start, and especially Inter Miami, with you know what has happened in the last two years, they they do need a good start. So, I would say that now I am concerned. Now I am concerned because um, if you look at the players that are coming in, in and um, let, let's mention two: Campana and Emerson Rodriguez. You know, it looks like they're not going to be ninety minute ready for the start of the regular season. Campana might be closer, right. and that's that's my question right there. Maybe he's ready. And I'm not sure that he is. And he's not in good form. Maybe we'll talk about that when we talk about the uh, about the game. Yeah. Uh, but Emerson, I'm 100% sure that he's not going to be ready. He's just started playing 30 minutes. So, and that scenario might be similar to some other players. Gregor, thankfully, he has been able to play a little bit more. And I think he, he, he'll he be ready. Um, But it, it is concerning. Robbie Robinson, I mean... You know, I wish we we had more of a clear idea to tell people exactly what's going on because we need to get that information out there. I don't think it's that big of a competitive advantage for opponents to know that Robbie Robinson is not going to be there for the first one or two games or the injury that he's going through. Right, because so, we, we, we oftentimes don't get much from the team. Sometimes we do if we ask Phil Noble in a press conference – you know, he'll tell us what the injury is, but not always. And, and the team's just not very forthcoming when it comes to injuries. And just so we can run through it, because I did put it, like I said, in a tweet earlier today, these are the 12 players that at some point in preseason have dealt with an injury or are currently dealing with an injury. So again, they either are dealing with an injury right now or they have at some point in preseason, just to make it clear. They're not all injured right now, but either that at some point they were or they are now. But it is relevant, though. It is relevant because if, even if they are training with the team right now, they might not be training a full team or sure, might absolutely. be ready to play full 90 minutes. So, absolutely. so that's something that's that's important to think about. Well, let's run through the, t- the 12. Ian Frey, Karen Gibbs, Victor Uyoa, Robbie Robinson, Mo Adams, Bryce Duke, Edison Ascona, Leonardo Campana, Emerson Rodriguez, Jairo Quinteros, Nick Marsman, and Jovan Jones. Now, again, Marsman and Jones... They were injured last year. They were they were recovering from those injuries. Gibbs was recovering from uh, off-season back surgery. But again, he's now suffered a, a hamstring tweak or a hamstring uh, issue. Look, for me, it's very concerning. And, at, and I know for Inter-Miami, it's concerning for them. And that they must be having conversations, obviously, behind closed doors as to what is going on, as to why they're suffering injuries. Jason Christ... In his post-game press conference on Saturday after the Columbus Crews said, you know, he brought it up. You know, he didn't he didn't make it a, a huge deal, but he did say that they were a bit worried or a bit concerned by you know the number of players that have gone out with injury and how do they how do they try to keep them healthy. He even used his experience as an MLS coach when when he was one uh, a head coach in, in MLS, and he said you know from his experiences the teams that do the best are the teams that obviously have uh, as full complement of players as possible i'm paraphrasing but to me this is very concerning because clearly clearly for me this is now this is just an opinion this is not no longer information but for me there is something that is being done wrong behind the scenes and it's not about assigning blame it's about figuring out the solution but something behind the scenes is not being done properly uh because i don't think you can have again let's say 10 out of the 12 two already were were entered with existing injuries i don't think you can have 10 injuries just off of sheer bad luck i still don't think that's coincidental they're either pushing these players too hard in training or something is being is not being done properly because 
I just can't. I just can't put, say ten players out injured in in five weeks of preseason or ten players suffering from injuries in in five weeks of preseason is is normal. I just I don't. That's think that really that's... hard to tell, though. I mean, it's it's really really hard to tell because. And by the way, I think you're missing Gregory on your list. I don't know if Gregory was injured. I think Gregory just came late to preseason, and they didn't want him to to maybe start training too soon. I, I mean, he was, as far as we know, he was never injured, as far as we know. I know he didn't play All in right. the first couple of preseason games, but you know, as far as we know right now, today, Gregory was never was never dealing with an injury. He might have been, but I mean, I don't know that. Don't he, know must, he must have been very late because, you know, some other players were out there playing. I mean, that's so. Th- there's a lot of things that we could talk about, right? There's, you know, we could say some of these injuries might be down to players, maybe not coming in at full fitness or in the condition that they should have been from from preseason uh, or from excuse me from the off season. Some of it could be bad luck, but again, for me, when you have this many, this many, I just can't. I just can't chalk that up to coincidence. I can't, and maybe They're I'm wrong. Very... Maybe I'm wrong, but I can't chalk it... it up to a coincidence. At least feel I, I think he has been talking about a lot. Uh, I ask about Emerson a lot because you know he's just a player that in Latin America people are following a lot alongside Campana. So you know I want to be up to date on what's going on with them. And I think two or three times Phil has given me the same answer with him with his injury, and um, he mentioned that it was not a, that a big a big deal. And um, that he was just so eager to play, but they wanted to hold him up a little bit and and make sure that he recovered. So that tells you that they are managing his injuries um, to some point that they are being very careful. So um, I don't know that this is exactly why we need a report, you know, just knowing exactly what's going on. Right, because we would have a better idea of, of what. Absolutely, to absolutely. Because you know what, some of these injuries, you know, we, we we would find out the length of them, and and there wouldn't be so much gray area. There wouldn't be so much mystery. And I do think that right. that, that is something Inter Miami needs to correct, just for their transparency sake and how they're perceived publicly, um, for media and fans as well. I do think that they need to be a little bit more upfront about injuries, because since day one. And they have gotten a little bit better, but since day one, they've been very hush hush about injuries and very inconsistent with providing information about injuries. Now, you touched on on, on Rodriguez, and I, look again. This is just me talking. This is my opinion. This is not inside information. Uh, well, p- part of this will be inside information, but or is information in general, and I'll I'll, I'll distinguish it so my opinion is not doesn't get you know mixed in with the information, but. Emerson Rodriguez and Leonardo Campana were signed about the same time or a day apart, something along those lines. And they both started training more or less at the beginning of preseason. Yes or no? Is that is that accurate from your memory? Yeah. Okay. I don't think it's a coincidence that shortly thereafter, and this is information, they both got injured. I don't think that that's a coincidence. I think that, again, maybe they didn't come in to preseason in you know at the level that they needed to be physically but maybe they were also pushed too too hard too soon given where they were conditionally again that part is not inside information the part that they both got injured is information the other part of why they got injured or how they got injured what led to their injury that's all you know up for us to to talk about and uh you know just give our sensations but i don't think it's a coincidence that they both got injured shortly after arriving. And I think I that there's remember. I think there's something there. I think that something needs to be looked at because again, it's not about assigning blame, it's about figuring out the answer to this problem. Because you cannot have, you know, player players' health is the number one thing. You obviously can't have a team if you don't have players. And Inter Miami already in preseason is having an injury problem. And look, we can go back to last year. And they had an injury problem last year that was concerning as well. And it was Robbie Robinson. Got injured in the second game of the regular season. It was a hamstring injury. He returned shortly thereafter against Nashville. Came off the bench. Didn't last very long. I think 12 minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Re- re-aggravated that, that hamstring injury. Returned a few weeks later against the Chicago Fire. Came off the bench again. And then he re-aggravated that hamstring injury again and missed some time and didn't play again, if I'm not mistaken, if my memory serves me correct, until July. 
So I do think there is, and this is just my opinion, my my sensation. I think that they might be pushing these players too hard too soon. They obviously want to be an energetic team, a team that high presses uh, at times, a team that, that has a lot of intensity and energy. Those are words that have been used, buzzwords that have been used over the course of this preseason. But I think they might be overdoing it. I think they might be overdoing it with certain players in certain moments, especially given the amount of hamstring injuries. Because hamstring injuries tend to happen from, and I'm not a doctor, but anyone who, who's been around the game knows that hamstring injuries tend to happen from you know increased intensity, uh, abrupt acceleration, and, and, and deceleration. Different movements lead to hamstring injuries. And... Kieran Gibbs and I'll, and then you, you know you can you can pick up from here. Kieran Gibbs in the game against Columbus Crew at the Carolina Challenge Cup. You can see where he injures his hamstring. You can see unless he was already inj- or unless it had already been injured while he was playing with it. <clears throat> excuse me, while he was playing with it, and then he just you know just gave out there. You see when he tweaks it, and it's on the goal on the equalizing play. He's darting back at. at Full sprint to try to put out the defensive, uh, or to put out the fire. Uh, the goal scored, and as he like walks into the goal to just pick up the ball, he clutches for his for his hamstring. So hamstring injuries are muscular injuries. It's not it's not a bone. It's not it's not a ligament. So you know I think overuse or or too much intensity um, could be leading to these injuries. But anyway, uh, Jose, continue. Uh, well, listen, I wouldn't go that far to say. Because I, I mean to say what they're doing with them during training. Because we're only there for 20, 25 minutes twice a week, so I wouldn't go that far. But I, I, I do agree with you that you know, I mean it's something that could be happening, um, because of you know the the list of of injuries. But at the same time, you know some of these players are coming in from you know. Like, Mo Adams was not here last year. Duke was not here. Campana, Rodriguez, Quinteros, they were not here. Um, with Robinson, clearly there's something going on that we don't know. There's not a report out there. We just saw him one day not training, and, you know, there was not a report. Um, Victor, you, I don't think that's that's that big a deal. We were able to ask Phil, and he said that they wouldn't expect that to be something. Jason, Jason Christ said it was a, a right calf strain. Right. So, I mean, I, I, I can only hope that, you know, this is something that um, gets sorted out throughout the season and they are able to work together and know the players a little bit better. Maybe there's new staff coming in as well, trying to do things differently in terms of nutrition and so many other things that go on other than, you know, just training and being actually on the field, but the way um, the players are taken care of and, um, there's, there's, there could be a period of adjustment because this is not something, this is not a trend that you want to see throughout the regular season. Because, listen, this team is going to struggle at times during the year. It's only normal. There's, there's so many players coming in, so you don't want to add another problem to that. So, um, it, it's not positive uh, to me. It's concerning because of the fact that you know, um, this this team right now it's it's not predicted to make it to the playoffs. And um, if you start struggling, well, that's, with that's your, your prediction. That's your that's not everybody's prediction. I'm not saying that I don't. Dis- that's not saying I disagree with you. But come on, you know, I I'm not saying I disagree with you. But not everyone will have the shared viewpoint that Inter Miami is not a playoff team or that won't make the playoffs. I'm sure there's some experts and some fans and some people out there that would say that they will make the playoffs. What? We might not say that. We might not say that. Come but... on, at least right now, it's impossible to say that. I mean, I mean that's uh, a, but that's an I opinion. Mean, that's an opinion. That's not that's not information. That's just an opinion. Obviously, that's an opinion because we're we're not even we're, we're not even started with the regular season. Right, right but I'm now, saying, but you're saying they that they're not a playoff team. I, I agree with that. Right now, I agree with that. I agree with that. But not they everyone are in will. trouble. So, I mean, it's it's just it's just a difficult scenario, and I think it's difficult for everybody. Listen, I mean. Coaching staff are feeling pressure. You know, if you get a lot of injuries, people are going to start thinking what you're thinking. And um, I might be, I might have to go and, and get in that train if, if this keep, keeps going on and 
in, in a few weeks and, and, and we go from 12 to 15 and maybe 16. You know, I'm going to start thinking something's wrong other than just bad luck. So um, it's concerning for everybody. It's concerning for the players, for obviously for the fans that want to see good product on the field. Um, it's just not an ideal scenario, especially in preseason to get started. So, but again, it all comes down to, you know, a, 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 a report from the team, a press release or information from the team detailing exactly what's going on with these players and when are, are they expected to come back. And if that's not the case, another press release comes out and they're telling, well, you know. It's, right, it's not, it's not like professional teams across all sports don't provide updates on, on injured players, right? Re- right? Regularly. I know that, I know the Dolphins do. I know, uh, and we're talking this, we're talking this football, but it's not some alien concept to provide injury updates on a, well, re- on a regular I, basis, on a regular basis. And again, basis. to my point, I don't think this is, I mean, this uh, the other the, the other team, the rival, the opponent, they cannot gain gain an advantage out of this. Like, do, do you really think like the Chicago Fire is really right now worried that Robbie Robinson is not going to be ready? Is that going to I mean, change? And the it's plan it's not Robert? it's also not like we don't go to practice and see who's available, who's not available, and we report it anyway. So the information yeah. is going to get out there one way or the other. So right, um, I agree with you. I agree with you that that part needs to change. Um, but I am concerned. Uh, and again, if if we did know what every player was dealing with, then maybe we wouldn't be having this conversation. Because then maybe we would say, "All right, well, you know, out of these ten players, uh, five are just dealing with different type of injuries, and but and you know, only two are dealing with muscular injuries. Because muscular injuries tend to happen when there's overuse or or muscle fatigue, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but we don't know. We don't know. So right. that leads to possibilities of speculating and. and conversing like we are right now and debating like Absolutely. we are right now. So Absolutely. Um, it's it's something that I think needs to change going forward. But anyway, we've talked quite a bit about the injuries. I know that's a massive, massive talking point now uh, at Inter Miami's preseason or in Inter Miami's preseason. But let's quickly just dive into the games. That's what I initially had planned for us to do for most of this podcast before the the injury started to con- or continue to pile up. Excuse me. I will quickly run through the first two games. For Inter Miami, they took the lead with a very, f- what seemed to be a very first choice lineup uh, against the Columbus Crew on Saturday night in Charleston, South Carolina. They scored off of an Ariel Lassiter finish. Gonzalo Higuain with a sublime pass in between two defenders to set that up. They were up 1 0 in the second half, but in the dying minutes, late on, Derek Etienne gets the equalizer. On his own rebound. So that game ends 1-1. The second game on Tuesday night. Was against the Charleston Battery. The tournament hosts. And Inter Miami wins 1-0. Off of a second half goal from who? Ariel Lassiter. And this time Inter Miami was able to hold on to the lead. Although the second half was very very frenetic. Very chaotic. A lot of back and forth. A lot of transitions. A lot of spaces. And Inter Miami went with a, a reserved fill, filled lineup in to start in that one. So, quickly, what's your main takeaway from the two games combined? And I have a feeling it's going to be Ariel Lasseter. <laughs> well, he's proving my point. I don't have to talk a lot about him because you are seeing it with your own eyes. What I told you from day one, that connection between Lasseter and... And Pipita was there from day one, and it w- and, and it will only get better. So yeah, that's that's about Addy. He's doing a good job, and I think he's he has already earned a spot in the starting eleven, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so uh, so my, and, and, my my main takeaway, and we can we can dive into it a little bit yeah. more. My main takeaway from the two games is just how defensively solid that they've been. Uh, you know, obviously the games once the wholesale changes are made and there's uh, a slew of substitutions that come in and, and, this, and starting at you know maybe even halftime or the second half that obviously changes the game it makes it a bit more abnormal um and and a bit unusual in that sense so it changes the dynamics but when there's been uh, a cohesive team on there from the start i've liked what i've seen from inter miami from a defensive posture now the columbus crew game is the game that you can better analyzed because it's MLS competition. The Charleston yeah. Battery is is not an MLS team, and the team that Inter-Miami fielded 
was not uh, uh, anywhere close to what they would probably field on on February 26th against the Chicago Fire. But you saw a lot of the similar patterns in terms of defensive play. And very tight at the back, didn't give up a whole lot. Maybe not as much possession as you would have liked, especially in that Columbus Crew game. But defensively, they did the job and they were very, very solid back there. And when they needed saves, they got saves. When they needed center backs to put out fires, those center backs did that. Damian Lowe was especially impressive in that first game against the crew. So for me, the biggest takeaway from these first two games, aside from your point that Ariel Lasseter is is looking good, which I I obviously will note. I mean, there's no denying that. I would say that, you know, the defense has also been very, very good from and very organized from what I've seen so far. Yeah, they have been very good defensively, and I think throughout the entire preseason. You know, they had a couple of mistakes every now and then in a game against Universitario, maybe. They should have capitalized on those, but that was a rough night for them. Um, and they, I think it did happen once or twice against DC United again. But after that, they have limit mistakes in the back, very well organized. And I think that side of the field is taken care of because it seems like players are comfortable with the system. They understand what their responsibilities are. And uh, But now we go to the other side of the field. I mean, how do you score? How do you score goals here? Um, so that's the next point. That's the next point because we're going to touch on some players. And, and one of them is Gonzalo Higuain because... In the game against the Columbus Crew, he he was one of two center forwards, right? Inter Miami came out in a 5-3-2 that when they had the ball switched to a, a 3-5-2 with the wingbacks pushing very, very high, especially Noah Allen, who started, uh, who has started in both games. But Gonzalo Higuain didn't stay up high with Leon- Leonardo Campana against the Columbus Crew. He dropped back and roamed all over the field. He had the tactical freedom to go practically anywhere he wanted to pick up the ball. At times, he was even behind Noah Allen or behind DeAndre Edlin um, in terms of his positioning on the field because he was looking to pick up the ball from the center backs. And he just had uh, the freedom, the freedom to, to play like a, a number 10 and to to look for the passes, to try to get on the ball and look for the passes. Obviously, he plays a sublime pass to Lasseter to set up his goal, the opener against the Columbus crew in that Saturday game. If you haven't seen the goal, look for it on YouTube or look for it on Miami Total Football's Instagram account because the the pass that Iguain hit is sublime. Sublime. Inch perfect and well-weighted. So did you like what you saw from Iguain in that game? Obviously, he did not play against the Charleston Battery, but did you like what you saw from him as this free-roaming forward? Or do you think it leaves something to be desired? Because not every... You know, obviously he hits that one pass that could make the difference and it did help make the difference uh, at least to, to, to that point. But there were other plays where he dribbled into a sea of Columbus Crew jerseys and he lost yeah. the ball. There was one moment where he slipped and he frustratingly you know, hit the ground, although a lot of players have slipped on that on that field over these two games. So, yes, you like what you saw from him overall or not so much? Um, I'm going to put it this way. I like the effort. I like that he's willing to be that guy um, that will help his teammates get better and and score. But I do not think that he's going to be effective at uh, 34 years old. Um, I don't see that connection between Iwain, Lassiter, and Rodriguez. And, I, and I'll tell you why. And, and this is obviously a hypothetical scenario in which Rodriguez and Lasseter are playing at the same time with him because they are a lot faster than him. And so he's going to be taken out of the picture. If they go full strength, there's no way Gonzalo Wayne can keep up with those two. They're just a lot faster. And, um, but I don't think he needs to keep up with them. I think his job would be to just feed them. Just give them long balls. They're not goal scorers for na- per, per I mean, the nature for them is to is to take the ball to the attacking side of the field and look for a number nine. They are not a number nine by nature. They're not. Absolutely. They're not. So they're going to be missing a lot of opportunities. But that's they, the conundrum. They're going to get frustrated. And they will be missing. And, and nobody can will be able to complain about it. 
because they are not number nines. But that is, but that is, they are the, not finishers. But that's the issue that Inter Miami faces, or at least that's the. And we did actually a podcast well, in Spanish last year, I believe, about Iguain. I think we touched on this, if my memory serves me correctly. If he drops back and he creates, but that's Franco, have, that's an issue. If if Gonzalo Iguain drops back. That is only an issue if that happens. Okay, I'll if ask you a question. If it's in the box, there's not a problem. Let, let, let me ask you a question. Is Gonzalo Higuain Inter Miami's best goal scorer? Best finisher yes. on the team? Okay. Yes. Is he right now on this team, this team right now as it stands today, the best playmaker on this squad? No. I, I would disagree with you 100% there. He's 100% the best creative force on this team. Nobody else picks out the pass that he picked out to Ariel Lasseter on this team today nobody else i don't know who else who else you think could pick out that pass on this roster it makes no sense for you to multiply gonzalo Higuain because what do you mean multiply i'm not multiplying him i'm just asking you is he the best striker you said yes you're giving him several responsibilities Uh, no 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 no. see no no hold on you're you're misunderstanding me to finish plays no you're misunderstanding create opportunities okay it's 34 years old but you're misunderstanding the my question I asked you if he's the best striker on this team, the best finisher, the best goal scorer. You yes. said yes. Yes. Is he also the most creative force on this team, the the best playmaker? I would say yes. That doesn't mean he needs to do both things. That doesn't mean he needs to be divided into both things. He doesn't need to have the, both of those roles. But I'm asking you, is he the most talented uh, or the player with the best vision and the best ability to hit a pass. Let me let me put it to you like that. Is he the player on this team with the uh, best ability to create for others? Because I again, said, I would say yes with 100%. And you don't even have to just look at this preseason game. Remember the game last year where he dropped deep and it was, uh, I forget who they were playing. I think it was maybe Cincinnati and they and they routed them 5-1 to one or something along those lines. And he had a, a, a hat trick of assists. He picked out passes from deep and found players in stride and on the run. So I again, does I'm not saying he needs to be both a nine and a ten. He's Make a weak clear. ten, weak ten. Fine, Very... but on this team, he's the best ten they have. On this team, he's the best right. playmaker they have. Okay, who's a better playmaker? I, I, who's I a would better playmaker? Say something. I would say something right now, and I might be on an island with this. Okay, say it. I, I might be on an island with this, but. I do believe, and this is a long shot, and I know this is something that might not happen this year. But I do believe Edison Ascona, he has that ability to connect with players moving forward. I think he has the touch. I think he has the talent. Is he there yet to to be a starter and to be a regular contributor in this team? I don't think so. But he has the talent. So if you're telling me that we have to give Gonzalo Higuain a number 10 responsibility just because he is the best that we have, the best playmaker, then the problem is not that he's the best that we have. The problem is that the team has been able to get somebody in that position that actually plays there and that has a lot of experience playing there or that he is that's a natural position for that it, player. It, all right. They don't have that. So he might be the best the best choice for them right now, but because there's nobody else. I mean, you're reaching. Where can I find a 10 within the roster? Oh, here he is. Pipita. He wants to play there. So let me grab him and put him there. And I that's, am not def- that's the only reason why I am not there. defending the choice to play him there because that is a tactical thing. And you know what? We will dive into that more next week because I, I have some information, but I'm going to hold it for next week because next week's our season preview show. And this is a huge talking point going into the season for Inter Miami is Gonzalo Higuain. But I'm going to save that information for now because not only because I want to keep it for next week, we've also gone very long on this first segment. And, you know, we could go on for a lot, lot longer if we continue this conversation. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you reminded me that that uh, I called you Island Jose last, last week when we were talking <laughs> in person because I do think, and that's fine. Listen, anytime you talk to somebody and, and you, you share opinions in any Anything and anything, whether it's sports, uh, whatever, anything you want to talk about, music, whatever, colors, favorite colors, whatever, food. If you share enough opinions, you're going to find some with somebody that you agree with, or maybe a lot that you agree with, and you're going to find some that you completely disagree with. So, look, I, you know, I, I don't think I see an Edison Ascona player that could eventually be a ten, but maybe you do, and maybe you know, you, you could be right because there are players throughout 
you know, there's so many different examples throughout the world of soccer that start at one position and then one coach has the vision, is a visionary and says, no, you know what? After years of seeing him there or after he's had his career there, no, I think he's more of a player that can play here. And then it's like they have a, you know, a second wind to their career because that change of position, you know, just brings out the best in them. So, and it's something that nobody else saw up until that point. So, may, you know, maybe you're right, but I would disagree with you um, as of right now. Now, I want to add one, 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 one more thing. Okay. To the quickly, quickly, because we're going long. Yeah. To the preseason games, Campana, I'm a little bit concerned with him. Just a little bit concerned with him. I don't see him connecting with his teammates on the field. And um, he missed a couple of chances, a couple of opportunities in the game against Charleston Battery. I think he should have finished those, especially if he wants to be a starter on this team. So I want to ask a little bit more from him. I'm not concerned by him because he's just playing his first game with the team. Yeah, and, but and, he, he, and he started and he didn't really have a preseason. He had an injury. He's one of the many players that had an injury. So he's learning still the style of play, the teammates. He's still finding his rhythm, his form, getting used to, again, that 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 speed of play that it does take some time after uh, una parada or after a stoppage. It does take it does take some time to rediscover that rhythm. So, I, you know, I'm not saying he's been wow or he's impressive. Obviously, he's he hasn't done – he didn't do great. Uh, on Tuesday night against the Charleston Battery, nor against the Columbus Crew, but I think with time and with more reps and with more uh, practice sessions and games, he will get better as will Emerson Rodriguez. I, obviously, they haven't done a great job so far in terms of the games we've seen, but it's early days for them, and you have to take into context that they haven't had proper preseason. So that that's the last things I'll say. Um, we will take a break now. We will jump into our. Very insightful and very, very fun interview with Damian Lowe, Inter Miami center back. We will do that next. We said we would have a special guest for you, and he is here. He is a Jamaica national team defender, a regular wearer of the Reggae Boys captain's armband. He's one of Inter Miami's newest signings, a big bright spot in this preseason, no pun intended, and a resident of one of the nicest places that any player on the South Florida team lives in. His name, of course, is Damian Lowe. Damian, thank you so much for joining us today, man. Especially since, as I understand it, it is the player's day off. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm feeling good. Um, put in a good session yesterday. Uh, the guys played good yesterday. The young guys got some chance to get some minutes in. So, yeah, all is well so far. Thank you. Cool. And how how is, just quickly, just to jump into it, how is your transition into the team going because we I think that was one of the first questions I had for you or one of the colleagues had for you during your introductory press conference after the open training but that was almost two weeks ago so how how is the continued adaptation going how is everything coming along on the field as well as off the field um it's been smooth you know again you know I've been a resident you know for, in South Florida for some time now for a couple of years so uh, adapting off the field is, is, is good. It was easy getting settled. Um, you know, th- again, there's a lot of familiar faces in the organization. So for me, it was quick to, to get used to everything. And um, it's just to like get get into the flow of things, you know, get the names right, get the schedule right, get timing right. Um, but that, that's been going well. Training has been going good. I'm enjoying every day. You know, um, again, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's exciting times and um, I'm just looking forward to, to everything that's about to happen here. And you said you've been a resident of South Florida for a bit. Have you always stayed in the apartment that you show on Instagram with the nice view of downtown Miami? Or have you had different uh, residences in South Florida? I've had one. When I just moved, I've had one. But I've been to this particular spot uh, for a number of years. It's really nice. From what we can see, it's really, really nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I have to be comfortable, you know. You work hard. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. 
So, Damien, you, you've obviously you've, you've been around a, a fair bit and had a, had a few clubs, but obviously it's interesting that you know you spent you know a few years in in Norway and then in Egypt as well. Then how was how did that compare to to playing in the in the US? I guess Egypt in particular must have been a, a real different experience. Yeah, um, Norway it was easy because everyone spoke English. You know, everyone, right. it was easy settling in. Um, the it's it's just more modern. Uh, everything the flow of everything there was good but when it comes to Egypt it was just a culture shock I've been to a number of countries and you know it's <laughs> this one was you know a big shocker to me but again as a footballer you know a journeyman I've been around um challenges come and I'd have, I had to adopt I had to you know learn their their culture and and, and their way of living and how they go about things and, and make sure I got settled pretty well so I could focus on my football Again, it was very, very difficult, but, you know, I stuck to it. And, you know, for me, I came in and I, I wanted to do well. So I didn't allow anything to kind of hinder that. What what, what in particular did you find sort of surprising? Just the culture, the way, the way of life or, or the, the levels of, of football there or what? What was what was most surprising to you? Just the way of life, you know, how strict they are with their um, culture and their religion and um, sure. their food and... Um, the food was pretty good, but like some stuff that you would like maybe catch up on your chicken or something and like, or you know, some maybe ranch on your uh, veggies, you know, they only use like olive oil and stuff like, so uh, stuff like that was kind of different and I had to adapt um, the timing of food, especially during Ramadan uh, when they were fasting. Um, to be honest, Damien, putting ketchup on anything should be banned worldwide. So, I mean, no, that's... No. <laughs> A little ketchup won't hurt. <laughs> speaking of food, speaking of food, Damien, I have to say this because if I don't, I will regret it later on in the podcast. And I, I didn't do this because we knew we were speaking to you this week. I literally just had the craving yesterday. I'm like a... Sometimes I'm like a pregnant woman. I just like get cravings. And I, I had two Jamaican beef patties for lunch yesterday, which I, I really enjoy, especially with some hot sauce. So just wanted to share that with you. Jamaican yeah, beef no, patties from Golden Crust. No, you're 10% Jamaican. <laughs> <laughs> maybe 11. Maybe maybe 11. Yeah. Damien, now, speaking, speaking on the culture shock in, in Egypt, is that one of the reasons that maybe you decided to come back to MLS and you decided to make this move to, to Inter Miami. I know we touched on it again during your introductory press conference uh, after the open training session a little bit ago, a week or so ago. But is is that one of the reasons that Inter Miami, the project, and obviously the city that you're familiar with, was that one of the reasons that it was so attractive to you? Um, to be honest, um, I've always been following Inter Miami since the you know inception. So... Um... We were in talks since day one, since, you know, Inter Miami came into the league. Um, but things just didn't um, happen the way we wanted to. Finally, now it happened after two years. Um, we've been, again, talking since summer, you know, of last year and came finally in January where we he came to an agreement. But um, Chris is someone that I respect and I, I look up to. Um, mm -hmm. Him for a long time since my Seattle days as a as a as a young player, and he's a good man. He 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 knows his stuff, and he reached out. He sh laid everything on the table and said, "Hey, listen, this is what's happening in the club. This is what we we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to build." Um, and I think it will f you will, you will fit everything that we're trying to do here. And I said, "Okay, you know, once everything is right and it suits my family and myself and." you know, I could come in and, and make a positive impact in the organization, then yes, let's do it for sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I spoke to Phil also, and, you know, Phil, Phil is someone, you know, who is big on my style of play and, you know, how, how much of, it, you know, leadership qualities and stuff like that um, I have to bring to the table and being, you know, impactful in the national team and a leader in the national team that also, you know, sparked interest for the club. And I said, yes, you know, um, I want to be a part of this new look into Miami, basically. Um, I want to come in and, and, and be impactful and be a leader and, and use my experience to, to, to bring the younger guys forward. And yeah, so I'm here now. 
I just wanted to quickly ask you then, what is your style of play? How would you describe your style of play? Obviously, uh, we've gotten a chance on the media side to see you in, in a couple of games now, but not everyone has been able to see the streams for this, this last preseason game that you featured in. And then before that, you made your debut in a game that was played behind closed doors. So a lot of listeners, a lot of Inter-Miami fans and supporters may not have seen you play or play that much. So how would you describe your style of play, Damien? To be honest, like, <laughs> I don't really think about it that much, mm-hmm. you know. For me, it's just total defending and, like, um, trying to affect the, the team in every way positively. You know, whatever the coach asks me to do, I'll, I'll do it with the best of my ability. But, you know, I'm good on the ball. I'm good at leading from the back, leading from the front, too. You know, um, I'm good in the air, um, splitting lines. Uh, fast break attacks with uh, diagonals and breaking up play. Um, I can be very aggressive sometimes. Um, but, <clears throat> yeah, for me, it's just total defending, staying disciplined at the back, helping the, the team to be organized. But I don't really think about my style of play, to, to be exact. I think that's more for attackers. Mm-hmm. For me, just, you know, get the clean sheet no matter what it takes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Damien, obviously growing up in, in Jamaica, you've got, you know, plenty of different sports to look at. Cricket, obviously, um, to basketball. But because of your dad, Jamaican legend, and, and Andy Lowe, was it, was it always going to be soccer for you? No, I mean, my dad didn't really have any effect of me choosing what sport. I was just good at football, so I played it. <laughs> I, I played cricket when I was younger. Also, I was good at that. I did track. I was really good at track. To be, I didn't even make a decision. I just stuck to soccer, and it it just manifested into me being a professional footballer. But it, yeah, I never really say, "Oh, I have to play soccer." You know, it just happened basically. And when you when you, your dad had, your dad also had a very varied career and actually played in Miami, you know, towards the end of his career. But when he when he went to England, when he played at Rushton, did you did you go over there? Were you over there with him during those times? No, I to be honest, I never went to, to, to watch a game in England when my dad was there. I was younger at the time and he was very high on us just staying focused in school, staying sure. taking in our studies. Um he never liked us traveling a lot. It was crazy times back home then too, pertaining to safety and stuff like that. So our family was very tight knit and on really say skeptic on what and how we, we go about things. Um so yeah, I never, I never um, went to England to watch a game. I usually just like either we used to have those little cassettes, you know, that you put in the VCR and yeah. rewatch the games when he come home and stuff like that. Yeah, and cricket was never, never an option for you. Cricket, uh, no, but I was good at cricket. I did play cricket um, in high school and middle school. I was good at it. I, I won trophies playing cricket, but um, yeah, it wasn't something that I thought about pursuing professionally because it's not it's it's a popular sport in Jamaica but uh, a, a kid growing up don't think about oh I'm going to be a professional cricketer sure unless he's really really good you know yeah. he, he's more like oh I'm going to be a track athlete or a footballer sure Steve Phil, Steve Phil. really likes cricket Steve really likes I love cricket. cricket he's definitely cricket. he's definitely shot me some text messages over the years where he's just watching a cricket get match that I'm not watching and he just gives me <laughs> random updates he's like I'm my going, ESPN uh, yeah. application <laughs> I'm going to Bob, I'm going to Barbados in a couple of weeks because uh, England are playing the West Indies in a test match so that would be good yeah you get your your butt kicked for sure <laughs> <laughs> probably probably and also Phil 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 was a good cricketer as a, as a kid both him and his brother were, were excellent cricketers so at least you can have some red hot cricket chat in the locker room next time you see him right uh, nice 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 a bit of banter for sure because you know I'm a big West Indies fan and you know England is really good at cricket too you know very good not, the, mo- not at the moment but no yeah not at the moment I was going to say that <laughs> Uh, D- Damien, you just used the word banter, and uh, obviously we've had some some laughs on this interview. And from what I've seen in the pictures and in some of the social media posts that Inter Miami has posted, you have fit right in and felt right at home. There's a lot of pictures of you flexing and making funny faces, and you seem like a very light guy in the locker room. Obviously, we're we're not in there, but uh, what is your personality like? What would you say about your personality and, and how you are? 
off the field and what you bring to a locker room. Because a lot has been said over the last two years, into Rami's first two years, about maybe the locker room not being the best and not maybe having the best environment. So what, what would you say you bring to, uh, to the locker room in terms of your personality and in terms of the banter that you can provide? I mean, I'm a fun guy to be around. You know, I like to have fun because if the team is having fun, you know, we're, we, we're going to get results. If the locker room is tight and, it, and everyone is, you know, having a good time and loving each other and having that brotherhood and, you know, we can have banter no matter what and everyone is just laughing and enjoying the, 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 the football, then we're going to be unbeatable. Even if we're not the best team. Teams that are more tight-knit yeah. and discipline and that brotherhood and that family is there, we're going to be unbeatable. You know, when the going gets tough on the field, we're going to transition that all that, you know, love and um, we say how much we appreciate each other to the pitch. Teams are going to have a hard day with us. And um, that's what I bring, you know. Um, I'm a leader also, I, of course, a no-nonsense guy. You know, I'm by the books, you know, on time, you know, self-discipline, get the job done no matter what the cost is, no excuses. But at the same time, I like to have fun. I like to enjoy my football because once I'm comfortable and settled, I play my best. So I try to bring that, you know, form of a uh, suave, they say, to the locker room or that kind of feeling, that mood. Yeah. And on the field, obviously, it's still early days for you, but what what is Phil asking of you from that sweeper role? You've had a couple of games now, a few more training sessions since we last spoke, so uh, you've, you've done very well, especially in this last game, um, in both games, really, that I've seen, but especially in this last game, I, I actually got a text message from a couple of friends that were in attendance at the game, and they were very impressed with you overall, and then they sent me a text just to give me their reviews. They know I cover Inter Miami, so they they gave me a text, and they they were very impressed with you. They even one of them noted a, a two on one opportunity that the Columbus Crew had that you were able to put out the fire the way you were able to close out the angle on the on the dribbler before closing down the space on the passing option. So you had a very good game against the Crew, probably the the man of the match, but. You know, what is, is Phil asking of you out there? Of course, to defend, of course, to put out those fires and, and clean things up at the back. But what else is he asking of you there as the sweeper, as the middle center back in that back three or that back five, however, you, you know, you, we want to look at it? To be honest, like, you know, I'm the spine. So he's just asking me to be there, to protect the back, keep the connection, um, start the plays, break up anything around the back, sweeper role, basically, but also lead, be vocal. Mm-hmm. Um, drive confidence in the players from the back, let them hear my voice because once they hear me pushing them on, charging them on, you know, dictating the play, how low we're going to drop or how we're going to be, when to press, then everyone is going to be in sync. And um, it's a big role, you know, I'm up for the task. Um, again, it's a new team, so we're still getting used to each other and different personalities and how we go about stuff, but it, it's coming together pretty good. I, I like what I see so far. I like how we're playing, how compact and disciplined we are defensively and how we we can fast break on the on, on the counter going forward so again um phil is it's not asking for too much you know it's it's natural for me again i'm a player where whatever the coach asks of me i try to do it with the best you know of potential and ability um i'm a, I'm a man of you know big tasks I, I like to take on the big job so it's just one of those days yeah i mean you know you've got the experience now haven't you throughout your career like you said it's a younger team but you're You've got that experience in the bag where you can you can help help these 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 younger guys. I know Phil likes you know like Mbika is is a young young kid, isn't he? Have you seen potential in in a few of these young guys? Yes, definitely. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. You know, um, but again, I was in their shoes once, so experience yeah. goes a long way. It, games go a long way. The more games they play, the more preseason minutes they get, the better they become, the more confident they become. So even though they don't have um, a lot of match minutes. They have that confidence, you know, pouring through them that, hey, I can get the job done. I could go out there and put in a shift for the team. And that's what's important. And they've been doing a good job so far. Does Phil, does Phil ask you to go long or short in terms of the build out? We saw there was different moments where you did a little bit of both. But is there is he stressing any one or over the other or is it just what the game gives you um, and, and you just make those decisions on the field yourself? Yeah, exactly. We just uh, make that decision. Whatever the game gives us, that's what we have to take. Or sometimes, of course, we're going to dictate the dictate what we do, but it depends on how the front 
three or front two of the opponents are, how high they come, how high they are backing off, how high they are pressing, um, how wide their team is. So it's different dynamics to or build up, build up and build up on play. So yeah, um, it's whatever the game gives us basically. Okay, and, and to begin to close out, Damien, you used the word journeyman earlier while answering one of our questions, and you have bounced around a lot of different clubs in a lot of different countries, which has helped with the overall experience. But I have to ask, is stability uh, something you're looking for? Because I know you've signed a two-year deal with with Inter Miami for, with a, a team option. For a third, is stability something you want at this point in your career? Um, is it is staying with Inter Miami for as long as possible the goal, or are you just open to seeing how things play out and then if another experience uh, or another opportunity arises, you take that? Or is stability definitely something you're looking for? For sure, stability. You know, because I've been around. Um, I think I'm at a point in my career now where you know I have to be stable and. You know, solidify myself in an organization for a number of years. But obviously, as a footballer, if a club comes that, you know, the offer is, you know, if it's insane or like, okay, yeah, it's interesting, um, you have to speak with the board, with, with your club, and see what best the decision is. But for right now, I'm focused on Inter Miami. Um, again, I want to, you know, be seen as one of the best in the league, if not the best help my team to, to, to bring trophies into the club and to bring a lot of victories and especially to bring happiness back into the fans and into the arena and into, you know, the community that, hey, you know, on a Saturday night you could come out and watch into Miami play and we're going to get um, good, exciting football with good results. Have you always been a good talker or has that come with experience as well? Because I think, I think I've already mentioned that to you. Uh, at least once that you you're definitely a great talker. You know sometimes players come in in an introductory press conference. They don't know the local media. They may be a little bit more reserved. But you you came in swinging, man. You came in and and really really gave a very good introductory press conference that impressed all of us that were in attendance. I mean everybody was was raving about it after you walked out of the room. So have you always been a good talker, or has this just come uh, with the experience? To be honest, it's natural, but also with experience, you know, but it's natural for me. We're just having a conversation. It's nothing <laughs> crazy. Um, you just have to know yourself, know your personality, what's a good question to answer and how to answer it. But right. again, you live in the moment, you know, um, you're not going to say anything that's going to affect you negatively. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, experience goes a long way. But also for me, I'm a natural. Um, it's just for me, it's just regular conversation, relax. I'm, I'm never nervous with any conversation I have. Like, uh, not nervous on the field and not nervous off the field? <laughs> I can't tell you last I've been nervous, man. Like, maybe since my debut. <laughs> it's football. We're not playing against aliens. You know, I'm not <laughs> saying... Like, and maybe a little bit because it's a big moment and stuff, but nervous, nah. Was the media was the was the was the media sort of spotlight in, in Egypt where you were? Was that was that in, in, intense or, no, or, or, or not? No, the media, um, they, they don't really speak English, so for sure, me, sure. they <laughs> wanted to interview me anyways. Ah, fair enough. Okay, mate. Okay, well, right. Damien, to wrap up, we're going to do the Tiki Taka that we did with Victor Uyo, who was our first guest earlier in preseason. Five questions, very simple. I will start, and obviously you're still new, so if you have trouble answering any of these, completely understand. But from what you've gathered, who is the best-dressed teammate on Inter-Miami? Uh, prior to me coming in, Breck, but now me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. All right, Breck. So we, we've heard Emerson, Breck, and Damien. Those are the three candidates we've gotten so far from two Tiki Takas. Steve, you're up. Well, what, what, what's your go-to, like, match day dress? You're going to be walking around in a tuxedo or something, or what are we going to see? It depends on how I feel. And, okay. uh, yeah, so if, if uh, and the weather. If it's a nice day, I'll put on some slacks with, you know, a nice button down or a nice uh, t-shirt but some days when I want to show it off a little bit I'll throw on a tux or a nice suit and you know show out I was I going to say it definitely has to depend on the South Florida weather because if it's 95 in July I don't think we're going yeah, to uh, see Damian wanna... Lowe in a, in a tuxedo but I am I'm looking forward to seeing you in a tuxedo at some point that's that's got to be a, one of the best looks that anyone's worn to remind me if and when that happens but Steve I know you have another one for the Tiki Taka okay here we go what, what's your earliest earliest football soccer memory Okay, Friends 98. Just the excitement around it. Like, yeah. 
how happy the fans were, how happy my family were, how excited, you know, they were that my dad was playing in the World Cup and the whole community was just full of excitement. Yeah. Amazing. Just remind everyone how, how what happened to Jamaica in that World Cup. We beat Japan two three goals to one. We lost to um, Croatia four goals to one and we lost to Argentina four nil. That was a tough run, right? <laughs> Yeah, but we all. If we, uh, to be honest, I think the Croatia game was tighter. Maybe three one or two one. If we had tied the Croatia game, we, we could have went through. But it was the first World Cup, so you know, guys coming from nothing, coming out, you know, amazing. From Garrison yeah. playing on the world stage. It's amazing. It doesn't matter how amazing. you do. It's just being there alone is an achievement. That, yeah, that's pretty impressive memory though that you could get the the scores either close to being correct or or being correct. It's pretty impressive because I'm I'm pretty sure you were what five five years old at that point. So uh, anyway, just just to continue on here, if you had to become a pro soccer player, what would you have become, Damien? Um, I'm I like the I like football. So to be honest, I'd be a sporting director, an agent, scout. Um, but I'm also you know big on entrepreneurship. Um, I've a number of um, business and real estate. So, yeah, I like that field. So, yeah, anything in the entrepreneurial world, business world, or just being, like, a, again, a scout, an agent, because I want to help players from Jamaica who just like the resources to get out that are really good that could play at the next level. I thought he was going to say football podcaster, and I was like, all right, we've got him lined up for after he retires at some hey, point in the future. I could might be good at that, you know, like... <laughs> As you said, I'm good at you know talking, but I don't know if I'm good at asking questions. That's the that's, that's the easy part. That's the easy part. We we'll 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 help you with that. That's the easy. That's why part. we get the that's why we get the big bucks, Damien. You see, okay. that's, why, that's why we're rolling at the top of our game. All right, I charge five hundred an hour. <laughs> that's <just> cheap. <laughs> uh, yeah, that might be slightly out of our price range, slightly, but you know we'll, we'll negotiate. All right, two more for you, Damien, and we'll let you go. Who's the funniest teammate at Inter Miami right now? Emerson. <laughs> Emerson, okay. Okay. Even though is it, so he has English or is it just actions and how he how he comports yeah, it's himself? How he is, his personality, you know, it's he's crazy kid. He's a character. Fun. Okay. Good. We're looking forward to seeing more of that from him. We've got glimpses, but obviously we haven't seen a whole bunch, but looking forward to that. Steve, you're up for the last one. All right, Damien, this is it. You you're having a you're having a dinner party around your your luxurious Miami apartment and you've got three Dream dinner guests could be dead or alive. Anyone who who's who's coming to your party? David Beckham. <laughs> That's an easy one. Yeah. Uh, Michael Jackson. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, ladies love Michael Jackson, so. Feel like- <laughs> <laughs> and. I could say Drake. Drake. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, that that'd be an interesting night. Yeah, for sure. Good, good, good photos. Yeah. yeah, for sure. D- David Beckham's definitely within reach because obviously he's uh, he's one of the owners. I thought he was going to say David Beckham, Jorge Mas, and Jose Mas after he started with David. <laughs> <laughs> and and they have they have been known to take the players out for for dinner. So you know at least you can knock off uh, one or, the, or all three of those at some point in the near future. <laughs> but Damien, again, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Especially since, like I said at the beginning of the interview, it's your guys' day off. What are, what are the plans for today? Just re- relaxing? Or are you going to walk around uh, Charleston? Uh, what What are you planning to get into today? I gotta get a gym session in for sure. Okay. Okay. Eat that cook tight, you know. I can't eat too much cake. I gotta watch the belly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, again, Damien, we really appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Good luck with the rest of preseason, obviously, at the start of the season as well. And we will talk to you very, very soon, of course, as we continue to follow Inter Miami here on Miami Total Football Radio. So, Damien, thank you again. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks so much, man. Bye-bye. Okay, so we hope you guys enjoyed that interview. We certainly did. Cinco was not able to take part. His schedule did not allow him to, but he is back for the Q&A session. 
Jose, are you ready? I am ready. Oh, I'm so ready. Okay, we'll start with this one from Twitter because it does have some backstory to it and it does have some banter between us here. And Twitter says, Are you nervous that Lasseter is having a good preseason and on track to take Robinson's spot in the starting lineup? I believe Jose yes. was on the Lasseter train, but you were doubtful he would get more starts. Jose's prediction is looking good <laughs> right now. And I hear you whispering yes over there or, or just mouthing yes. But <laughs> And look, I will fully admit that Ariel Lasseter has been impressive in this preseason. He's probably been one of the best performers. If you know, if Ian Frey was probably the MVP through five, or excuse me, six games, five weeks of preseason, Ariel Lasseter is probably the second or, or third candidate. You know, I think Damian Lowe is probably in the conversation as well. But, but I will also acknowledge that your bet is looking a lot better, and we haven't established what we're going to bet but by next week before the start of the season in our preseason pod we will 100 percent establish what the bet is i will stick to my guns and say he does not start 25 of 34 regular season games no, no, I'll, no, no. i will stick to no no you can't no see this yes, is where 21 no, games left no Just no no see no clear, everybody no, no. See, 21 no, games no. left if, the if bet you if eight. okay I will, on the amount no, of games started no, 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 in the you year. You cannot count preseason games. and No, no. Right, listen, I, we'll leave it up to the listeners. And the listeners can decide. Because I will not take the bet if that's what the bet is. Because preseason games... They're going to be making some calls to, 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 to ask people to send us messages. <laughs> telling that it's count. Preseason when games I told don't you count, exactly, brother. No, in person, no. I told you he will start 25 no, games. I, and game. I'm pretty sure I said it to you in the pod where we, where we made the bet. Without laying out what the what the bet was, which is our mistake, but I'm going to stick to it. But I said 25 of 34 games, so he's only going to not start in nine MLS regular season games. I'll take that bet. That's why I took the bet. Not okay, me. so to answer the question from Twitter, yes, he is very <laughs> nervous, as you can tell. Very, very nervous. I am not nervous. I will pay the bet if i lose the bet i'm not a betting man but obviously if i bet i will stay true to my word and and i will pay up i know we've definitely talked about either if if you win i will treat you to a peruvian meal and if i win you will treat me to a Honduran meal that's absolutely part of the bet but let's see if we can find something else that will make it a little more fun for the listeners something else that they can enjoy because us eating doesn't really do much for right. the, for the listeners, so let's see if we can just, come up with I'm an idea. I'm gonna ask you something on the record. Just stay away from trying from trying to break the rules. All right, <laughs> just 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 to be clear. All right, on the record now. Listen, we we need to establish by next week though, because if you if you're gonna come up with counting preseason games or U.S. Open Cup games, then I don't know. If we oh, have to, then we have to then we have to change the numbers. Count. Absolutely. Then count. we have Let to change the numbers. Then we have He's to change. Not the gonna numbers. start U.S. Open Cup games because you know. Phil wants him for MLS, and unfortunately, MLS teams don't start most of their um, the, the the core, the most important players. They don't usually play early on on US Open Cup, so he's gonna miss one game or two in US Open Cup. But you know that's that's gonna make you happy. Let's clearly define the bet by next week. Let's come to terms. Let's come to an agreement on it because if if you want to add Open Cup games or preseason games, then we have to change the numbers. No, 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 no. We, then it has to be right. Then okay, we'll talk about it after. We'll talk about it off air because otherwise we're going to sit here and argue for the next <laughs> the next twenty we minutes. We have been arguing. We've been arguing for weeks about yes. this because you so you, you keep knows, counting this... preseason games, which don't <laughs> do not count, brother. They do not count. But when when players get their rewards and their bonuses and etc. for appearances and goals and everything, the preseason games, preseason goals, preseason stats do not count. Anyway, yeah, but I'm smarter than that. I'm not a player. <laughs> well, I'm, the, I'm smarter no, than that. The, My country are a lot then smarter you're, than that. Then you're ruining the bet. N- next question comes from Doe Snows. Yedlin has been awful these last two games, as well as Campana. Is this preseason rust, or is Neville not great at bringing out the best in players? Has there been players, or have there been players that have gotten significantly, significantly better under Neville? So I would chalk it up to rust with Yedlin's case because yes, he has made his debut. He, he played in the first. Uh, he's played in both games actually. And he hasn't looked all that great. He hasn't impressed. But again, like with uh, Campana and to a lesser extent Rodriguez, I think it's a matter of finding their feet, learning the styles of play from their teammates and the overall system, learning the runs that they like to make, learning how you know where you can move and how you feel more most comfortable going off of other players' movements. That takes time and that takes games and that does not just take friendlies. That takes real meaningful games. So... Uh, I do think Yedlin, like Ampana, like Rodriguez, will get better with 
more time. I think this it's too early uh, in preseason to, to really judge those three players who have only made two or one appearances. But yeah, I, I think it comes with a position as well because, you know, I, I was mentioning Campana before that I was a little bit concerned because, you know, a couple of chances there were, you know, good opportunities for him to score to show a little bit more, you know, his finishing, finishing touch. With Yetlin, you know, it's it's a little bit more complicated because especially with this formation, he has the responsibility to be good and well-organized defensively. And um, and I think he has been able to do that part, but because of who DeAndre Yetlin is, we're going to ask him a little bit more, and we, we want to ask him to be a part of the offense as well. And that's the one part that, to me, it's been missing. I mean, maybe he's making the runs, but there's not a good read from the midfielders. And, and, you know, that comes with time. So, right. yeah, I don't think it's it's that big of a concern right now. Iguain definitely didn't find him a couple of times. I think even Jason Christ noted that after the Columbus screw game that there there were a couple of times where he projected forward and, and he didn't get the pass yet. So, you know, definitely, again, something that the team can work on. Let's, let's do a couple more because there is one with regards to the players we're most looking forward to this season, but we, we have answered that. Um, in a previous pod, so let's just let's just do a couple more here, and it's one. The next one comes from Luis, and he asks for all of us. Campana and Iguain are not the solutions. Too slow. Who can step in? And does Phil have the cojones to bench Iguain? Uh, look, the, no. You say no. Uh, I would also say I have a very. I see it to be very tough that Phil benches Iguain for you know more than a game or anything of that like I, I just don't think he will consistently bench uh is you know the player that i think is the best scorer on the team and the player that i think is the most creative force on this team i just don't don't see him doing that uh but often in 2020 get frustrated with Iguain very quickly because of his track record they get frustrated very quickly and and fans that have been watching Iguain for years now are going to get frustrated this year because, you know, it, it's it's going to be a challenge for him to stay the course of the regular, the course of the regular season mentally to stay um, focused on, on what he really wants to do. Well, hold that thought. You know, that, to hold me, that thought, to me, that's the question. Hold that thought because that is something that we will also touch on next week. All right. I, All have, right. I have some things Just lined up teaser. for next week. Yes, I have some things lined up for next week. Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Because we're going to have a, a much more, uh, a bigger discussion about that next week. Um, who could step in if Iguain and, and Campana are not the solutions? I mean, Lasseter's clearly an, an option up there. And he's shown that with his wheels, he can stretch the defense, get in behind. And he has scored a couple goals in preseason. So he's certainly one option that they have. I don't think, you know, they have a plethora of them, but I think he's one of them. Last question. Tenacious EZ, and he's got a lot of questions here. He said, is the 5-3-2 really our best formation? I know uh, Jose is going to say no to that. Um, he didn't no. say that. I'm saying that. Franco's saying that. Uh, Tenacious EZ then asked, will we have a true 10 this season? When should we expect to sign another DP? And will Drive Pink Stadium finally nail down the atrocious parking situation? So there's a lot of questions there. Uh, you know, we've you've essentially answered the... The five three two is that really the best formation? Let's answer one each here. I will answer when they should expect to sign another DP. Inter Miami cannot sign a DP right now as is. When Matuidi is bought out, then they will be able to buy or land another DP. Right now they can't. They have Iguain, they have Pizarro who's still on the books as a DP, even though he's not officially on the roster. And we explained that on a pod. A few weeks ago as to why that is. It's a lot of MLS mumbo-jumbo, but yes, he's still taking up a DP slot even though he's not on the roster, and so is Matuidi. So until Matuidi is bought out, or until Higuain leaves at the end of the season, if that's what happens, Inter Miami cannot sign another DP right now. Okay, Jose, you can answer, will we have a true number 10 this season, or will Drive Pink Stadium finally nail down the atrocious parking situation? Which one? Oh, well, no, I'm not going to take on the parking situation. That's not on me. Come on. That is horrible. <laughs> I can completely understand. I have people sending me messages. How do I get to the stadium? Uh, so many questions. The parking is something that I tell people, try to get there the day before. That will save you a lot of trouble. Sounds like you're uh, answering the question to me, my friend. <laughs> All right. Well, if you want to count that as an answer, don't do it, though. Don't do it. Um <laughs> Um, and, um, what's the other question? Well, they have a true number 10 this season, which we touched on. 
I don't nah. think so. Iguain will be the closest they have to a number ten this season, in yeah. my opinion. They'll be the closest. They, I don't think they they'll they'll get it. Although, you know, if the Blaze Matiti situ- situation gets solved, then maybe halfway through the season, you know, somebody comes in. I just don't see it happening in the next ten days before the start of the regular season. So, you know, it's a, it's it's something to work on for for Phil. Uh, hopefully they get out of that. Well, Phil and Chris. It's, you know, Chris, it's, more, of Chris, Chris. it's more of a Chris you know, job to find a Phil, 10. For Phil, it's something to work on prior to the start of the regular season and or the arrival of the number 10, if that happens midway through the season. And, uh, of course, that involves Chris as well. But as of right now, I don't, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it. Okay. Well, then, that does it for the Q&A session for this week's pod. So my final thought will be, and I, you know, I'm going to tease it to make sure you stay tuned in and make sure you listen to next week's podcast because it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. We hope you enjoyed this one today. Obviously, the the first segment was a bit different than we intended it to be. We expected this one to be a lot more analytical uh, than it was in terms of the games. We wanted to go into more detail with them, but obviously, the injury became a very the injuries became a very big talking point especially after Ian Frey uh Ian Frey's ACL issue so make sure you stay tuned in to next week's show we are going to dive into Inter Miami's season in a preview pod we will give predictions we will take a deep dive into the state of the team in general where we think the strengths are the weaknesses and we will have some talking points on a couple of things that I've teased which are very big storylines regarding this team that's all i can say for now we will have very big talking points uh with regards to inter miami next week oh also one more thing before i forget inter miami's new pink home jersey the authentic version has leaked online and you can see it on miami total football's instagram page it has a heartbeat design on the sleeves as well as a square of the heartbeat design on the left hip and it looks more or less like the replica jersey, just a few light touches. I still think it's overall, it all gets a passing grade. Maybe not the most, uh, maybe not the best jersey out there or the most creative, but I, I do like it overall. Maybe could have done with a little bit more black or, or some black touches, on, or I don't know if on the neck or, or elsewhere, but anyway, the it'll be officially unveiled on Saturday. So that does it for this week's podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening yet again we have been trying to get these to be shorter but yet somehow they continue to excuse me to stay around the same length we're gonna do our best to try to shorten them going forward but again thank you if you've gotten to this point thank you so much for listening thank you to damian low for joining us again if you haven't already please give us a follow uh on all our social media channels and leave us a review on apple podcast for jose armando and steve brenner I am Franco Panizo. This is Miami Total Football Radio. And we'll talk to you guys again very soon.